He was a, a manager, assistant manager. I can't remember now of a grocery store. Uh, and he kept losing everybody he would train as you know, stock people and other managers because you know where they'd end up having to go? War. War. That's right. Because these were generally people who didn't have college degrees. Uh, and they weren't in college, obviously. Uh, and so they were being pulled off for the war. So anyway, uh, but that has nothing directly to do with what happens. That, well, that's related to that. But then also he quit his job. He came home and told, uh, and I was in uh, uh, I was before first grade. No, no, I would have been in first grade then. Um, and apparently came home and said, I've had it. He was so sick and tired of the owners of this place who had no idea what they were doing. Uh, and he said, I quit. And my mom was like, <laughs> um, but there were lots of jobs. All right, so we're still in the middle of this long expansion. He applied for a bunch of jobs and then took the first one and then ended up getting every job. So, but anyway, that's when we moved to Ohio. All right. Uh, pardon? Oh, uh, Middletown and then, no, 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 Dayton and then Middletown, down near Cincinnati. That's why I'm a lifelong Reds fan. Yeah. Are you from Ohio? Uh, my mom's side is, but up uh, towards the north, like, so Okay, yeah, my mom and dad also used to live in um, Cleveland. Yeah, Cle well, actually Parma, which is outside of Cleveland for a while. My mom really liked the weather there, believe it or not. That's because she's a limey and doesn't like it hot over here. All right, so then we have this recession, and then, um, oh, whoops, I'm sorry, I've, pulled, yeah, because instead of using the little ruler thing on the side, I used the five cells. five quarters recession in the 1970s. Ooh, yeah, 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 okay, this is interesting. All right, so yeah, that's, that's the end of the Vietnam cycle, right? So let me go back here to the summary chart. So what have we got for this Vietnam cycle? What drives the expansion? Uh, I'm going to say here, the big spending on the government uh, on the Vietnam War, because remember, even when investment fell, that kept it going, uh, in the Great Society program. That's all part of one thing. All right, what turned it around? The falling investment, I'm sorry, the, the, the rising interest rates and falling government spending, and there's some evidence for both of those. Uh, what about the last one? Uh, why isn't there saturation of, of, of capital? Well, investment was still going up, but... And again, you don't have enough background to see this part of it yet, but, but the falling government spending should also reduce profits. So really the bigger thing was the shock of, they were still investing, um, and that was creating profits, but the government spending is going down, and they're like, oh crap, we thought we were going to do even better, and now we've got, what was it? Five out of six quarters of negative rates of growth of profits, right? So then that panics them when they stop spending. Okay, now, so the first two are almost pure private sector, right? Second one, we've got the war, Vietnam War. Third one, fourth one, and fifth one are all going to be about the OPEC oil embargo. All right, this is all going to be about the oil shock. So again, trying to put this in your head as sort of a, uh, a history of the United States economy since 1954, that's going to be the story for the next three. Oh, and this is, I found a cartoon where um, he's telling his, uh, the uh, U.S., uh, urban needs, so that's his Great Society program, right, on the right, and that's his Vietnam War on the, on, on the left, and so he's telling the uh, uh, Great Society program, there's money enough to support both of you. Now, doesn't that make you feel better? Uh, so, and the obvious implication being, he's supporting the war, he ain't really doing his uh, poverty thing. Well, the uh, economy's been expanding the whole decade, I mean, doesn't that, like, don't you kind of... It should help. Trap of thinking like, oh wait, yeah, I'm gonna. Uh, yes, I do have the money to do all this. Yeah, yeah. If you can get Congress to approve it, of course, if you lie about it, then, then it helps. And probably easier to lie about the war than it is about uh, great society programs. I like how on the time cover it's just like inflation, recession, or like not like a description or like anything that's coherent, just like three words. Yeah, that's true. And you know what? That's actually a very good point because they're, they're, they're not real sure about the connection here. The, something that, well, well, okay, so let me, let me do a little background here, okay? Things are going along not too terribly. Well, they're not going gangbusters either. That's right. Yeah, we got th this new expansion here starting in first quarter of 71. Uh, unemployment, as you can see, man, it ain't, ain't doing anything great. It finally makes it down to 4.8 by third quarter of 73, all right, uh, in this expansion. So it's not exactly tremendous, you know, uh, progress on unemployment. Um, GDP rates of growth, if you remember what the numbers look like above there, there's a couple of really, you know, spectacular quarters here, but nothing like it was before. So it, it's going along okay. Um, now, uh, and then I'm also going to show you, uh, let's see. 
Well, oh, yeah, investment. An investment, well, I mean, if you were looking at these data at the time, would you have said, oh my God, there's about to be a recession because investment's going to collapse? It's not entirely obvious. We've got one quarter of negative 13.73. Well, we had a negative 10.34 up here. So usually you string a couple of quarters together of negative investment. So from the, the perspective of the endogenous people, they're going to say it's not really endogenous here, it's exogenous. All right? So the, the endogenous people don't deny the possibility of exogeneity. They're just saying, but there's already something built in anyway. We don't need the exogeneity. It can happen regardless. And so they're going to say that here. They're going to say, look, it wasn't tearing it up, but it also wasn't exploding. Okay, now, fourth quarter 1973, if I may. Oops. Eraser, eraser, eraser. All right, this is going to be a terrible map. 11.15% GDP growth. What, uh, this is the Sinai. Okay, what oh, country's here? I got you. Yeah. Egypt, Egypt. Egypt, that's right. And who else attacks Israel in October of 1973? Right up here. Syria, that's right. Here we've got Lebanon, but it's Syria right in here. And this is occupied by the Israelis from the 67 war. This is occupied by the Israelis from the same war. Jordan doesn't get involved in this one, so I'm not going to bother. There's somewhere along in here. Um, but they get attacked, all right, from two directions. Surprise attack. Western um, intelligence forces have been telling the Israelis, oh, my God, they're building up on the, uh, on the um, uh, borders. You're going to get attacked. They're like, oh, no, we're not. No, we're not. The entire cabinet um, collapsed and was replaced after the war was over because they had denied uh, any possibility of the invasion taking place. But not only do Egypt and Syria invade, but the Soviets had given them all kinds of great new equipment, among which were these surface-to-air missile launchers that created a SAM umbrella, surface-to-air missile umbrella, that the Israelis, at least early in the war, couldn't penetrate. And the Israelis have been used to having total supremacy in the air, all right? And so, you know, you got an armored column coming across the Suez Canal, all right, we'll just blow up the bridge and we'll take out all the tanks on the way. Couldn't, didn't happen. Uh, they also gave the Egyptians anti-tank guided missiles, which the Israelis were not prepared to defend against, all right? And basically, it's almost like a like a pong level computer game you fired the missile it literally it's wire got it literally spooled out wire behind it and you're sitting down there doing this trying to make sure you hit the tank so early on in the war the israelis had no defense for this apparently by the end of the war you would see israeli tanks with wires draped over them where they had dodged it at the last minute or it turns out shooting at the guy that's doing this is also really effective uh, yeah. and so they but they learned how to defend against it later but at first they don't know what to do and so the egyptians are pouring over the canal oh i gotta tell you this too. The, the, the Israelis had made these big sand berms that would stop tanks. You make it steep enough, it's really hard to get a tank up it. And this is fantastic tank country in here. Uh, and so when you're at the beach and you make a, a sand castle, if it's not your little brother or sister, what eventually destroys the sand castle? And that's what they used. They used, you know those little fire truck things, or those fire boats that shoot out put out fires. Well, they just use fire boats to take down the, the uh, big sand berms. More than that, they practiced in front of the Israelis. And the Israelis are like, huh, I wonder, they must really hate sand in Egypt. Well, I guess I can see that, yeah. Uh, and so they had no idea. So this was a, you know, a, a huge surprise, but, all right. Uh, now, meanwhile, and my favorite General Rommel once said, that you should not judge a society by how well it conducts war or else we would have no civilization. They weren't very good at war, all right? They horribly outnumbered the Israelis uh, and the, it was close, but the Israelis kept them held off up here. So the, the Israelis' attitude was, uh, we can stop them with one arm tied behind our back. We don't know how to stop them. They're coming over and, and they're, and they're um, uh, finding tremendous success in doing so. Okay, so... Um, Eventually, I was going to tell you something else about that, and I've, it's already... Oh, I know, I know, I know. But the Egyptians had not prepared to be this successful, and they didn't know what to do. Um, and because they didn't want to bring these missile trucks over the uh, canal, because they thought, what if we get cut off? Uh, if they cut in behind us, we've lost all our missile trucks. So they just stopped, and the Israelis are like, why have they stopped? 
because we didn't stop them, but they just stopped because once they moved the trucks up, you know, you got maybe your SAM umbrella out to about here, and that's as far as they would go because they were too afraid. They had, they had not realized, or they had not expected to be this successful. Okay, then comes in America. Uh, uh, it tempted me almost to do part of the theme song from Team America. What was that movie called? Uh, Team America? Team America. Yeah, oh, great movie. I posted that I was watching that one time on Facebook. You would be surprised the number of professors all across campus like, oh, I love that movie. Oh, I love that It was one you thought they'd be ashamed of loving, but it's a great movie. The Kung Fu scene early on. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, anyway. I <laughs> Uh, and then he said, what, when I need, I'll give you a signal when I need help. And what was it? The only word is uh, Durka, 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 Durka. Okay, come on in. So anyway, uh, fantastic movie. If you haven't seen it. It's the Citizen Kane of, of puppet comedies. Right. <laughs> now, so uh, then the U.S. comes in, you know, bails out Israel, gives them lots of supplies, that sort of thing. Boy, oh boy, were they ticked off. Okay. Now let's go to inflation. What impact does this have on what's about to happen in 1973, fourth quarter? All right, think about the supply and demand for oil quantity. In fact, let's just think only about the demand for a second. Very steep demand curve, especially back then. All right, not a lot of substitutes. Uh, the Western world, well, and the developing world was heavily dependent on imported oil. And check this out, though. There's no flex fuel vehicles that you can run your car off of. Uh, Not yet. No corn vehicles? Not yet. All we got is screwed over. What if I jack up the price? Or what if I reduce the supply, rather? I should say it that way. What if I reduce the supply um, from where I'm pumping out Q sub zero to, to Q sub one? Let me mark out how much revenue you've lost. Okay, you've lost this much revenue. But of course, you've gained. Uh, uh, uh. This much revenue. Looks like an awful good deal to me. So there's only a very few oil exporting countries that dominate the market. And they certainly had the power, uh, just as He-Man did in the Masters of the Universe, they had the power to reduce quantity like this. They could have shifted the supply curve back anytime they wanted to. But they didn't, all right? Not until now. Uh, not until what's about to happen here. And the reason they didn't was this. Let's see, I need another color. Uh, what haven't I used? Uh, 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 green, I have to use green again. I think I've got a blue somewhere, but anyway. Now, now I'm obsessed with finding the blue pen. Oh, I must have left it in the classroom. All right. um, okay. There's the quantity of oil we are going to pump out of the ground. Let's say each of you is an oil exporter. And you are going to be voluntarily cutting back how much oil you pump out of the ground. How big of a chunk of this line segment do you want for your country? Oh. As much as you can get. And before October 1973, y'all just fight with each other all the time. Uh, and you can't get an agreement on it. This happens, tell me where to sign. You know, because I'm so ticked off at the Western world. We had Israel knocked out. Uh, we had this war won. And then they bailed them out. Tell me where to sign. You assign me, and they, they signed up for particular quotas. All right? And they'll slice it up along you know, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, and so forth. Uh, and oil prices then like triple. All right? So first of all, let me show you a column I haven't really bothered with so far. And that is consumer price inflation. And you can see the CPI numbers over here. And well, let me back up a little bit so it's a little higher uh, back in the 70s. Well, up until 72, look. Uh, up until 72, you've got... 3.24, not a real high rate of inflation. It starts to actually accelerate before the um, OPEC oil embargo. And this, they were, already being, they were already worried about it because of what they called the wage price spiral. That a union would go on strike for higher wages, they would win, and then what would the firm do to their prices? Raise their prices. So then what does, the, what does the union do the next time the contract comes up? Oh, well, now you're making more money. I deserve a bigger chunk of this. So you had this sort of spiral of wages and prices. It was already an issue. But now look at what happens to inflation after that, all right? Well, uh, and this was a huge shock to the economy. This was absolutely a huge external shock when these oil prices go up. Uh, and this causes a recession. I mean, look at what happens to investment. This is, where's the average over here? We've got a negative 12.45 uh, on average of investment here. Uh, and so as a consequence, let me go back to the description here. 
And these, as I say, these next three are going to be all driven by the same thing. There actually was a yeah, big jump in investment. There had been a general motor strike. Uh, and investment and profits had fallen. And optimism was still high, but it really wasn't clear that there was going to be a recession. Yet. But then OPEC, all right, uh, oil embargo in October. And they're going to say, what's the exogenous view going to say? The oil embargo. It was the oil embargo. What's the endogenous view going to say? Investment was slowing, but it was the oil embargo. All right, that's what caused this uh, recession to take place when it did. And so let me go to the summary chart. And I've got here, um, you know what? I'm tempted to pull that off there. I think I will tonight. Uh, is I'm just going to leave that just as a little shock. Because honestly, that was the biggest factor. I mean, by far. And uh, uh, so we're going to have a rise in takes place during the expansion, but then the oil shock. So I'm going to change that one on the right over there, that cell, to just oil shock. Uh, so for the, the exam. endogenous view says the oil shock was such a big deal, you didn't need another factor. Correct. Correct. Yeah, it, it was such a huge factor, we don't really need to... Because again, the endogenous view doesn't deny that exogenous is possible, but the other way around is true. I mean, you know, the, the exogenous view is like, no, no, that's all it is. Uh, but they're saying, no, no, you're right on this one. That, that's, what, that's what happened. And so, now we're going to have uh, oh, and, and by the way, we go back to, to, to uh, Daniel's comment here and about this. One of the big things under the Ford administration was win. Whip inflation now. And people wore win buttons. Uh, and I remember reading something about because I was not conscious of the economy at this point, uh, but um, reading something later about, uh, I guess it was Ford in particular, that, that said, our problem with inflation right now is it's like everybody's standing up at a football game. And so everyone feels like they have to stand up and have a better view. If only we could all agree to all sit down at once, then we could all see the game and relax. And he's like, the problem is we're all asking for higher wages. That's the problem. If only because we, uh, which then of course causes higher prices, which then leads us to want higher wages. If we could all just agree not to do that, then it would, it would uh, take control of that. So he was seeing it sort of as a, and not, not him of course, it was his advisors, uh, as something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we have, let me go back to the data, this big shock that is then going to have reverberations for the next two cycles after that. Uh, here it is, the beginning of it. And that's going to be one, two, three, four, five. So that's going to be six quarters. That may be the longest one to that point. I, I'm not going to go bother and go back and look. But, uh, and look at that, all those negative rates of GDP growth. Uh, then the, yeah, I won't even bother with the columns on government spending and stuff because I've already said that they don't explain it that way. Now what happens next? Well, here's the next expansion. And look at the unemployment average during this expansion. Now, you've got to be careful here because this is, of course, including the early quarters where unemployment was still going up, all right? And still, you know, so it, it, it took a quarter before it turned around. And so this number here is including some of those early bad quarters. But even then, even 5.9 would have kind of sucked compared to what we'd had in previous years. And we only get as low as 5.85 before it turns around again here in this 1980 recession, which... See if I've got those data over here. That's expected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, notice the inflation column, the growth in CPI over here. That it kind of slows down for a while. Now remember, it's being compounded. So this is, for example, six percent on top of five six, on top of seven one, on top of seven five. So you know, so it's not like, oh, when inflation was only three point six three percent here in second quarter seventy six, that must have been great. Well, it would have been had it not been for all the other previous quarters, right? You know, so but th this is on top of everything else. But look at what inflation does down in here. It jumps back up again. And you know why? They got back together. Like, hey, man, we got some people who aren't following the quotas. And uh, you know, like that opening scene in The Untouchables where um, uh, Al Capone is walking around the table with a baseball bat. Baseball is a team game, you know, and then he ends up beating the guy in the head, uh, you know, and killing him to, as an example to the others to say, you know, we're all going to play this game or you all will look like this guy right here. Wow, that's twice today a baseball example has been very relevant. Uh, so they did it. Oh, that's true. That's right. Um, and then, so they did another round of uh, hikes, and so inflation goes back up. All right, now let's see what the description says. I cannot tell you how much, when the first time I put this class together, and this took 
hours and hours and hours and hours. I, I, I collected all this information from <clears throat> the Survey of Current Business, uh, monthly issues of the Survey of Current Business I was checking out and reading through each one, trying to piece together these stories, because it's not really taught anymore. Uh, and I really found it so interesting and wanted to teach a class on it. So, uh, but yeah, this is what I've been looking forward to that whole time, was to get into talk about stuff like this. So we're still kind of sluggish. But there was a Tax Recovery Act of 1975 that really boosted things. That's going to be a factor mentioned here. Let me jump over and show you. That's going to be a factor mentioned here in the recovery and the expansion part. Also, retooling investment. Okay, now what does that mean? That means that firms, there were new government regulations trying to reduce our reliance on oil. And then there was voluntary attempts to reduce our reliance on oil. Uh, and there were new industries that were important now that hadn't been important before. Apparently, ceiling fans became incredibly popular because it was an easy way to cool your home uh, relative to paying for the um, electricity for air conditioning. And so you have a lot of retooling going on during this period that really helps the expansion. Uh, combined with automatic stabilizers, which I'll talk about on Thursday, new anti-recession programs, and a need to retool to meet government regulations, GDP growth stays strong until 80. Oh, now, here you get a place where you have a direct impact of economic theory. The Federal Reserve decided in October of 1979, you know what, I think the monitors are right. I think that this is what drives inflation. And what we need to do is start lowering this sucker right here to pull this sucker down. So they go through what they call the monetarist experiment. And yeah, the Federal Reserve adopted a full-fledged monetarist approach along with an explicit acceptance. If you read the Federal Reserve documents, it talks about Say's Law of Markets. And that look, this will automatically fix itself over here. We need to drive the prices down by lowering the money supply or, or, or by restricting the growth of the money supply. Uh, and so they therefore shifted from targeting, to, to, they didn't target interest rates anymore. They targeted the size of the money supply instead. And uh, because they believed that the inflation was caused by much expansion, they engaged in this highly contractionary policy. So let, let, me, let me stop right there and show you the data. Now this again here under uh, federal funds deflated, and I'm sorry, it says deflated by CPI federal funds. What that is is my, my column heading is actually federal funds. And then I put a note to myself, oh, by the way, that's deflated by the CPI, by, by, by the Consumer Price Index. And so, let's see, which recession are we on? Okay, so we've got interest rates in real terms shooting up down here to 10. And in nominal terms, people were buying houses like 20% interest rates. It's unbelievable. So these interest rates are going sky high. And why? Because they are purposely thinking to themselves, we need to do this to accomplish this. All right, so that, that was the a sort of conscious adoption of the monetarist view of how inflation operates. And notice, by the way, we're not there yet, but the next expansion is so short, it's only three quarters long. We don't have an early part and a late part. It's just three quarters. Uh, technically, I think it's closer to a year if you count it by months. But um, it's going to be a very short uh, uh, expansion. So in some ways, this is one long recession right in here. Uh, and so, we've got this conscious adoption of the monetarist approach, which drives interest rates uh, to levels that, there are, that exist nowhere else on this chart, all right? And again, this is minus, minus inflation. Well, how high was inflation? It was 3.6. Uh, so the federal fund's interest rate was actually 14.22, because it's minus this right here. That's the rate at which one bank borrows from another bank. That's the wholesale price of money. That's not what you would ever pay, all right? You would, you're gonna pay you know, another five, 10% on top of that, depending on, uh, on your um, uh, uh, credit worthiness. So, indeed, big increase in interest rate, very important part of what happens in this cycle, and it's exogenous. Okay, so let's go back to here. Exogenous view, this reduced demand, uh, and um, there was also a, a jump in Middle East prices again. What was that from? From this renegotiating of the quotas. Um, this is saying, look, even without the new Fed policy, investment and profits were already decelerating. Uh, so, though the external and policy shocks certainly hurt, so it's not going to say that wasn't a factor, the economy was already slowing, is what this one's going to say. Oh, I don't know, let's have a look. And 
from an endogenous viewpoint, you're going to look at investment column for the economy was already slowing. And so for the expansion that starts in second quarter 75, sure enough, if you look at the investment column, it was already slowing down. All right? So even just from the private sector perspective, you say, well, it was already slowing down anyway. Now, absolutely, the change in the interest rates um, really hurt. Although by then, um, it's still not what it's going to be for the second recession. All right? Notice that the interest rates at this point for this recession are still, I mean, they're, they're going, well, actually, they're going down here relative to the rate of inflation. But then again, that's because OPEC raises prices again, so the re inflation rate's going way up. Um, look at that. 16, I lost it, 16 percent inflation. Um, I remember I learned to drive in 77 and thinking, I guess it's always going to be like this, to where like when you go to the gas station, you say, can I have like $3.40 worth, please, because that's all I got. Uh, and back in those days, you would target an amount of gas you were going to buy dollar-wise because it was so expensive. Uh, and then there were the days where they, you, you could only buy gas if you had, an, if it was an even number day, only if your license plate ended in an even number. If it was an odd number day, which by the way, I guess gave them an advantage because there's more odd number days in the year than even number days. Those bastards. Um, doing that in 77? Uh, I don't think it was 77 yet. As a matter of fact, I have a picture of it here. I thought that was a Nixon, your administration, like uh, price ceiling and stuff. Oh, I took that picture off. I used to have a picture of somebody standing in line as part of the, um, uh, uh, I, so I don't exactly remember, well, wait a minute, we lived in North Carolina, uh, and so that means I was in like 7th and 8th grade, and if I graduated high school in 79, it's going to be mid-70s, somewhere in there, uh, so that's when it would have been, and I don't remember how long they kept it in place because I didn't pay much attention to things like that back then. Um, okay, so there's, there's the shock we just did. Yeah, 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 that's right, that's right. Okay, so, and I'm sorry, this is what I want to show you next. So, okay, what's the summary for that one? All right, so here's, and this, I hope you're getting to where it's easy to remember these things. Eisenhower 1, Eisenhower 2, Vietnam. That, then the next three are all oil. These are all three related to oil. Then you've got Desert Storm, which is going to come uh, right before the longest uh, peacetime expansion in history. September 11th one, you should be able to remember what, you know, the order of these events here. That one, it'd be really sad if you didn't know that was last. Um, so, we've got Oil Shock 2 here. Uh, increase in the interest rate by the Fed due to the monstrous experiment plus the second oil shock are the two exogenous factors. What are the two endogenous factors, or the three endogenous factors? Um, two of them are the same as this, all right? Plus investment was already slowing down, all right? So, uh, you know what though? I need to change that to saturation of capital. Why wouldn't that just be the same as that? Yeah, okay, so I'll change that as well. Because uh, again, I've been going through this n multiple times trying to simplify it for you. Uh, but we have the same items in this cell as we have in this one because they agree that those factors are both important. Uh, plus, they say, well, look, investment was already slowing down anyway. So we had that factor as well. Okay, Volcker, this is really one long recession. And Volcker is really um, putting the screws on now, driving up the um, interest rates. And... Now, there's an, ex there's an expansion in there. There was a car rebate program that the survey of current business said was especially important in reinvigorating consumer spending, uh, but it expired, all right? And we actually have some pretty decent rates of GDP growth during this very short expansion. Uh, 762854, not terrible. Um, unemployment is actually marginally higher on average than it had been before. But if you look at the peak numbers in here, it's, it's starting to come down a little bit, but a very short expansion. Uh, what does investment do? Investment's starting to drop off again already, but you know, what it notes in the, book, in the, in the reading is that, hey look, but there was some big investment too, 42.9 and 42.59, there's a huge jump in physical investment, and it slows down again, but look at these interest rates. Um, where are we? Oh yeah, right here, in this column right here. Uh, and so this is when the interest rates really hit their peak is under Volcker. They started back here in fourth quarter of 79 with this monetarist experiment. And if you look at the in, uh, interest rates starting in, is this fourth? No, it's third quarter 80. 
Look at what they do up through this next recession. They are continuing the monstrous experiment, and it really hits at height in this recession, which was the worst recession since the Great Depression. In some respects, it still exceeds the one we just had. All right? uh, I mean, the one we just had was worse. But in terms of peak unemployment, this was actually worse. And we did it on purpose. So let me go back to that explanation. That's this one. And this one really is called the Volcker Recession. I made up most of these names. I didn't make up the Volcker Recession. I didn't make up the subprime uh, cycle. But, uh, and I think one of the Eisenhower ones really is called an Eisenhower Recession. But this one was already called the Volcker Recession because he did it on purpose. Right? Uh, and you know, despite incredibly high interest rates, investment did go up. But the expansion was only a year. Yeah, if you do it, um, uh, when, the, when the MBER calculates it quarterly, they give you three quarters. Or when they calculate it monthly, they end up giving it 12 months. I'm not sure why the difference is. Uh, part of the upturn was from due to a car rebo rebate program, but it expired. Uh, oh, yeah. There was also um, a savings and loan crisis, tight monetary policy, da 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 uh, So what caused the recession? Well, the um, uh, monetary policy. Now, I'm going to return to this later. And then, what about the exogenous view? Well, really, it was in a continuation. So, uh, yeah, the high interest rates did not help. And I want you to ignore the other stuff about inflation there for now. So, Volcker, what do we get? Car, in, uh, car rebate program. Look, exactly the same thing, but there's not, another mon there's not another oil shock this time. All right? And really, this is exactly the same thing as the previous cell, only there's not another oil shock. So, so think about that. Now, they're different here. Remember I said this is basically one long cycle here, one long recession. Um, the reasons for the upturns are different, but the reasons for the downturns are identical on both columns with the exception of the second row doesn't have the second oil shock because one didn't take place. So. Now we finally get out from underneath all this inflation. And I will say this very briefly. The monetarists figured they solved it by holding the money supply back. The post-Keynesian view is that two countries went to war in 1980, each of whom had a share of this line down here. Who were they? Their names are almost identical. Iraq, Iraq. Iraq and Iran. And they start beating each other to death. Um, it was interesting. Iraq expected Iran to simply collapse because they were in the middle of that Iranian revolution. They thought, oh man, what a perfect time to go in there and snag these really fertile lands right here on our border, which we've claimed for years. Anyway, uh, and so they attacked. It united the Iranian people. It was just like in the movie um, Independence Day. All the earth united against the aliens. Uh, well, all of Iran united against the Iraqis. The Iraqis also did some really stupid things as they invaded, too. But anyway, uh, so they're all of a sudden in like an almost decade-long war. Just I think it's, I can't remember how long the war is. Um, beating each other senseless. Let me look that up real quick. Iran. Iraq war. Thank you. And let's see what our friend Wikipedia says. Yeah, to 1988. All right, so 1980 to 1980, a long, bloody war, and they start cheating. Like, man, do I need some money. So let's say that Josh and Eric had gone to war with each other, and they start cheating. What are the next rest of you thinking? Why the hell am I holding the oil price up for them? You guys holding, you know, with, withholding supply is just helping them. Screw them. So everyone starts cheating. And the oil prices not only stop increasing as quickly, they actually start falling. So... What that means